Gopi Jan Bala Bhagiri Bhadadahi Gopi Jan Bala Bhagiri Bhadadahi Yashoda Nandana Braja Janaran Janha Yashoda Nandana Braja Janaran Janha Yamuna Tira Vanatari Yamuna Tira Vanatari Yamuna Tira Vanatari Jai Hadha Jai Haradha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Gopi Jan Bala Bhagiri Bhadadahi Yashoda Nandana Praja Janaran Janha Yashoda Nandana Praja Janaran Janha Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare 
Mutago Haribo 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 Mutago Haribo Jai Jai Prabhupada Prabhupada Prabhu Pacha Shiva Prabhu Pacha Open Manande Haribo Om Magyana Tamaranda Siyakyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Unmulita Nyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Panchakaupata Rudyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhaya Bhacha Pati Tanyam Pavane Vyo Vaishnavidyo Namo Namaha Namaha Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Srinivadi Paschacha Deshatadine so, just to refresh your memories a little bit, those of you who were here yesterday will remember we're speaking from the second canto, first chapter. And the chapter begins because it's Sukadeva Goswami beginning to speak. Sukadeva Goswami appeared at the end of the first canto. And with the appearance of Sukadeva Goswami, Maharaj Parikshit questioned him about what is one's duty, at, particularly at the point of death. So this is the question which leads to the speaking of Srimad Bhagavatam. And we pointed out how the first two cantos of the Srimad Bhagavatam are described as the lotus feet, the Pada Padma, the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. That the different cantos of the Bhagavatam represent different limbs of the body of the Supreme Lord. So it's important for us when we come to see the Lord, we begin from his lotus feet. We approach with humility and we look down and we begin from the lotus feet. So we similarly hear Srimad Bhagavatam from the beginning. It's important for us. So I'm assuming that you've gone through the first canto and I'm beginning with the second canto which is the speaking where Sukadeva Goswami is beginning to give his instructions. So Maharaj Parikshit had asked, he wanted to know particularly what are we, what should I do and what should I not do? He wanted Sukadeva Goswami to tell him clearly, what do you recommend me to hear about and to chant and what should I do and what should I not do? So Sukadeva Goswami begins by speaking about the things which we should not do. Well, actually, before that even, Sukadeva Goswami begins, as you can see in the first verse here, that he begins by congratulating Maharaj Parikshit, that your question was is very good. Mentioned here, it is very beneficial to all kinds of people. Right? Lokahitam, beneficial for all men. So Prabhupada writes, the very question is so nice, it is the best subject matter for hearing. Simply by such questioning and hearing, one can achieve the highest perfectional stage of life. 
So in this way, Sukadeva Goswami shows his appreciation for Maharaj Pariksha's question. And then Sukadeva Goswami begins by speaking about what we should not do because Maharaj Pariksit wanted to know what am I supposed to do and what should I not do in preparing for the end of life. So Sukadeva Goswami is telling him what we should not do and he talks about people who are busy, mentioned here, uh, they're engrossed, they're blind to the knowledge of ultimate truth. Remember, Ampashyatam Atmatatvam Greheshu Grehamedinam. Right? They're blind. And they're, these people are compared to the Grehamedis. And last night we also spoke about some of the innate, the qualifications of the Grehamedis. How they're very busy for money. And the money is all for their sense gratification. They want to acquire huge houses, much bigger than they actually need. You know, we can live comfortably in small houses, but if we get the chance to get more money, we want the bigger house like that. So we want to live luxurious lives. We want to separate ourselves. We think if I have a big house, I can have my own room. I don't need to share a room with everybody. <laughs> and it's, we want to isolate ourselves and be away from other people. So that kind of mode. This is Grihamedi. And because you're envious of others, you're bitter towards other people. You don't have a, a kind and uh, benevolent attitude to help others and to be friendly and to get along with people. But it's all arguing, fighting, like Kali Yuga, the age of quarrel. And and practically you see it everywhere. Every, you go to somebody's home and they're all yelling and shouting and screaming at each other. It's Kali Yuga. But we're devotees, we're not supposed to be in that mood. That is the mood of the Grihamedis. I remember uh, I was up in it was, it was BM some years ago up at Bukit Metro Gym. And there was a young couple were coming, they were coming to the temple. So they were living in some house and there were people living next door to them. And, and they said, you know, that couple, all they do is yell and scream at each other the whole time. And they go to temple. It's strange, you know, they're supposed to be religious, pious people going to the temple, but all they do at home, they just yell and scream and fight with each other. What a surprise, what's going on? So, we have to be careful of these things, you know. Just like Prabhupada talks about Dhritarashtras, he said 5,000 years ago there was only one Dhritarashtra, but today you've got a Dhritarashtras everywhere. So Kali Yuga is progressing and it, it gets worse, doesn't get better. Or we say, well, isn't it the, the golden era of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Yes, for the devotees. For those who take shelter of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they're safe. But for those who are in that Grihamedi mentality, who still have the desire to enjoy the life of sense gratification, then they'll be influenced by the age of Kali. So Sukadeva Goswami's warning here to Maharaj Parikshit 
persons who are materially engrossed. Materially engrossed. They're so busy in their counting the money and the sense gratification that they're blind to the knowledge of ultimate truth. But they have many subject matters for hearing in human society. Many subject matters. Watch television, watch all these Bollywood movies or Tamil movies. So many things to occupy our mind and absorb us. And in this way we waste the valuable time in the human life. So Sukadeva Goswami is warning Maharaj Parikshit that don't be thinking about all of these things. Now your Maharaj Parikshit has only seven days left to live. He has to take the time very seriously and utilize his time just for hearing and chanting the glories of the Supreme Lord. So Sukadeva Goswami then goes on to describe more about the Grihamedi mentality, things which we should not do. The lifetime of such an envious householder is passed at night, either in sleeping or in sex indulgence, and in the daytime, either in making money or maintaining family members. So this is Kali Yuga. Well, of course, maintaining family members is a duty, it's a responsibility. All right, we agree to that. We're not saying you shouldn't maintain your family members. But that's not the goal of life. There's, we have to understand there's more to life than just simply maintaining the family members. We have to, un we want to make sure the family members are cultivating Krishna consciousness. They're awakening to the path of self-realization. So these are important points. So, the, the chapter goes on, Sukadeva so Goswami describing more about the great ladies. He said, people devoid of Atma Tattva do not inquire into the problems of life, being too attached to the fallible soldiers like the body, children and wife. Although sufficiently experienced, they still do not see their inevitable destruction. So in this way, uh, Sukadeva Goswami is describing the situation of the great ladies, the materialistic-minded people who have no thought of self-realization and whose only concern is sense gratification living comfortably and trying to enjoy the material world. So then Sukadeva Goswami then describes about those who are not so much in that Grihamedi mentality, who are not so materially absorbed. And he describes in this text number five what the devotee, one who is actually uh, wanting to progress in self-realization, what they have to do. So he described what you shouldn't do, now he's describing what you should do. And what you have to do, he said, one who desires to be free from all miseries must hear about, glorify, and also remember the personality of Godhead, who is the super soul the controller and the savior from all miseries. So Sukadeva Goswami is bringing his instructions round to introduce devotional service that you have to hear and chant and glorify, remember the Lord. So this is the first steps of Bhakti Yoga. Shravanam Kirtan Smaranam. These are the beginning of Bhakti Yoga. Sukadeva Goswami's 
encouraging Maharaj Parikshit in this way. And he's telling him, he goes on to describe the duty of the human being. What is our duty? That you have to remember the personality of Godhead at the end of life. We have to be, the test is coming, right? Just like maybe you, you do a course, maybe when you were in school or you go to university, college or something, and you have the final exams. So the final exam is the big test. So similarly in our life, we have the final exam coming at the end of life. And at that moment, at the end of life, we want to be able to remember the personality of Godhead. We want to be able to fix our mind on Him. And that should come if we've been practicing throughout our life, then certainly at the end of life, then thoughts of the Lord will come into our mind. Sometimes it's asked, well, what if a person dies untimely? There, sometimes it does happen that uh, sometimes some even devotees, uh, very, very wonderful devotees, some, they were put into some unfortunate situation and uh, they were somehow they were put into quarantine maybe during the COVID when the COVID was rampant they contacted COVID and they were put into hospital and they were put into isolation and put into some kind of ICU or something and no association and even put into some, you may be given some kind of breathing apparatus so it would be difficult to chant yourself and couldn't hear anything and no devotees there so if you leave the body in that kind of situation difficult to fix the mind on the Lord what would happen to such a devotee? So it's stated in the scriptures that if someone has dedicated the service of the Lord throughout his life, if he's been dedicated, dedicating himself to the service of the Lord, then at the end of life, the Lord will not forget him. Even though he dies in a situation where he himself is not able to properly fix his mind on the Lord. Now sometimes it happens even there may be car accident it can be very sudden and you don't get the, you may not get the chance. But if you've dedicated your life throughout your life it's, it's been a life of service to the Lord, then the Lord remembers that devotee and he will deliver that devotee from the path of birth and death. Even though the devotee may not be able to remember the Lord due to the situation, but the Lord does not forget him. That's what the Shastra says. So, the end of life, that's the final test. And we, we, ideally, we do want to be able to remember the Lord in that situation. So then, Sukadeva Goswami goes on to describe that even those who are great transcendentalists, they're above all the regulative principles and restrictions, devotees like Sukadeva Goswami. They take pleasure in describing the glories of the Lord. They don't have to follow regulative principles. Sukadeva Goswami left home without even receiving the Upanayana from his father. He just left home. And he, he left and he was naked. He didn't even cover his body. But he was above all rules and regulations because he was fully fixed on the transcendental platform. He was an Atmarama, meaning one who takes pleasure in himself. 
So such devotees, they take pleasure in describing the glories of the Lord. And Sukadeva Goswami gives himself as an example of this. You can see in text number eight, he says that he studied Sukadeva Goswami, he said he studied Srimad Bhagavatam from his father, Srila Asadeva. So, it's probably that points out the importance of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam from devotees. One devotee asked Prabhupada, what's better, that I will sit and read the books myself or I will hear from somebody else? And Prabhupada said, better you hear from somebody else. The devotee said, why? And Prabhupada said, because you hear from someone, they will pull you by the ear and make you hear. But if you just sit and read yourself, how much you will read, how much you will absorb, we don't know. So Prabhupada preferred that we hear. And we see in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's also described in that way. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu instructed the devotee, he said, Bhagavata Kore Diye Bhagavata Stani. That if you want to understand the Srimad Bhagavatam, you must go to the person Bhagavat and hear from him. And this was the instruction given by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And the devotee went and he heard from Ramananda Rai. And he was convinced that this is the real way to hear Bhagavatam, by hearing it from the Lord's devotees. All right, so then Sukadeva Goswami goes on to give uh, examples about perfect beings. And he describes how he himself was on the transcendental platform, being an Atmarama. But even as an Atmarama, he was attracted to hear about the pastimes of the Lord. This is the explanation of the Atmarama Sloka. It's an important verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And Lord Chaitanya discussed it with Sanatana Goswami and also with uh, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. They both asked Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to explain Atmarama Sloka to them. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained it in many ways. So Atmarama Sloka. Atmaramas chamunayo nirgranda apirukrami kurvanti ahaitakim bhakti itam bhuta duno hari. That even those who are atmarama, that they're transcendentalists, they're taking pleasure in the self, but even those souls are attracted to hear and to chant also the glories of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, of course, this is bewildering for the Mayavadis because the Mayavadis consider that everyone's God. They have the monistic philosophy. So they have difficulty to explain the Atmarama Sloka. But for the devotees, it's very clear. So Sukadeva Goswami describes how he was attracted and, and he said uh, he, yeah, he describes what should be the proper mood in hearing Srimad Bhagavatam mentioned here. He said one who gives full attention and respect to hearing Srimad Bhagavatam achieves unflinching faith in the Supreme Lord, the giver of salvation. So we were, we ended the class last night where we spoke about what should be the proper mood in healing. So it's described here in this verse that we should give full attention and respect to hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. Prabhupada describes to us how he got 
corrected by his own spiritual master one time. The Prabhupada describes he was sitting in the class listening to Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada talking when someone from behind tapped him on the shoulder and he turned around and he said, what are you two talking about? Prabhupada point, uh, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada pointed to the two of them because they were talking. So when we are having Srimad Bhagavatam class, we are not supposed to talk. It's not respectful to the Bhagavatam. Right? And Prabhupada, uh, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati said to the one man, he said, Do you think you have purchased me because you donate five, five rupees every month? And then he said to our own founder, Acharya, he said, Do you want to come up here and talk? And Prabhupada said, I was mortified. He said, It was a moment of greatest mercy from my Guru Maharaj to be chastised. The Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was pointing out the importance of giving respect to hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam. So like that, give full attention and respect. That is the proper mood in hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. Alright, maybe we'll go back to the PowerPoint here. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so the qualifications of the ideal hearer, giving respect, right? We spoke about this. So then, the Srimad Bhagavatam then goes on to describe Harunam Anukirtanam, meaning Anukirtanam, constant chanting of the holy name. The chanting of the holy name is discussed. Because Sukadeva Goswami is encouraging Maharaj Parikshit, the proper way to become fearless at the time of death is by chanting the holy name. So, Prabhupada quotes different Acharyas' comments on this importance of chanting of the holy name. Here he quotes Sridhar Swami. Sridhar Swami was the very first commentator on Srimad Bhagavatam. So he comments that no other method of self-realization can be more beneficial than this. So generally we have the custom within our devotee network that whenever someone is critically ill and leaving the world, the devotees will like to gather by their bedside and we will perform kirtan. And indeed Prabhupada wanted that. You can see the film of Srila Prabhupada leaving the body and you can see the devotees all in the room with Prabhupada and everyone is chanting the holy name. This is the proper way for leaving the body. And of course Prabhupada was showing us leaving the body in the dham, in the holy place, Vrindavan, surrounded by devotees, wearing the garland from the deities. Just last night uh, devotees were going to a, a funeral and they came and took garlands to decorate the, departed, the body of the departed soul. 
like that, they have that culture, the, the garlands of the deities, the holy chanting of the holy name, Ganges water, Tulsi leaves, these things are all auspicious items for the departed soul, for the body of the departed soul. But the most important thing is the chanting of the holy name. Then Jiva Goswami, he adds a condition that not just only chanting of the holy name, but one must avoid nam aparad in order to achieve the ultimate result of chanting. So every morning here in the temple room we have the custom after Mongol Arti we will recite, we, no, we, we do, I think we do like we generally read Chaitanya Charitamrita a little bit and then we will also say the ten offenses in chanting of the holy name. Because if one chants with offense, then one cannot get the, the, the desired result of this chanting. So it's very important that we know what are these ten offenses and that we try to make every effort to avoid chanting with offense. So Jiva Goswami uh, points out that yes, it's good, constant chanting is good, but the chanting should be without offense. And then Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he explains that amongst the angas of bhakti, hearing, chanting and remembering are the three chief ones. This has been stated in verse 5 of this chapter, the fifth verse of this chapter said that. And among, this, among the three, hearing, chanting and remembering, chanting is the chief. Within chanting, when the chanting is done properly, then there will be also hearing and there will be also remembering. So, chanting is very important. Sometimes you have the His Holiness Bhakti Bhagavat Maharaj, Bhagavat Maharaj, what's his name? Brihad, Brihad Bhagavat Maharaj. So he liked very much to have japa sessions and he would invite people to come and chant 64 rounds in one day. And you know, it's very good to get the devotees to chant more because often we find devotees are not very, they don't give a lot of importance to chanting the rounds. We don't know what time you get up in the morning, but often, you know, you're supposed to get up, devotees are supposed to be up by 4 o'clock in the morning. Prabhupada wrote many letters like that you can hear. Now, Malaysia is a little different the time, that's why we have Mongol Arti a little later here. Like in, in India, Mongol Arti is at 4.30, even in Hong Kong, Mongol Arti will be 4.30, but here we have Mongol Arti 5.15, because the sun rises much later here. So, the Mongol Arti is 5.15, so at least the, you should be up by about 4.30. If you're not going to make it by 4, you do want to try to get up by about 4.30 in the morning. You don't want to be getting up too late. You need to get up early and take advantage of that morning time, which is called Brahma Mahota, the auspicious time in the day. Now, everyone, all people, different religious faiths, they all have that habit to wake up early in the morning. The Buddhists, you see the Buddha, I, sometimes I, I have to stay in a Buddhist temple, they all get up by 4 o'clock in the morning, they have a big bell and you hear boom, <laughs> you beat the gong, you know. Wake up, the monks will all get up and they go and take the bath and clean their teeth and whatever. And so they get up early and you can hear also the Muslim people, the Islamic people, they have their morning prayers also. When we're having a Mongol RT, generally they do morning prayers about 4.30. 
they used to always, I can always hear. And the Christians also, they have their early morning mass. So, we are also expected to wake up early, not late. You, you get up early and come to Mongol RT, your whole day will be auspicious. Uh, Prabhupada even said, if you don't come to Mongol RT, you have to distribute one Krishna book. Those were, that was in Prabhupada's time, in the days of our book distribution. Anybody didn't come to Mongol RT, fine was, you should distribute one Krishna book. So, that's a very nice punishment. But, we do encourage people, wake up early. Why? So you can chant in the morning. Because that's the best time in the day to do your chanting. Later in the day, oh, it's not so good. I don't know. To chant it last thing at night, it's not the best time. Sometimes you have to do it, but it's not ideal. You do want to take advantage of the early morning hours to do chanting. And a good place to chant is here. You have this wonderful temple here with a nice even courtyard out there. And it's very nice to be here and chant in the morning. We have the beautiful deities. And even there's devotees living nearby, but still they don't come. So, <laughs> it's unfortunate. We do encourage people, try to come. Certainly, I'm sure if uh, Jantataka Maharaj was here, we'd all come. We'd all like to be here. We wouldn't miss. All right, and then uh, another point here. Chanting should be anurkirtana, should be constant. Following in the footsteps of previous authorities and according to the level of one's realization. So different devotees will have different realizations in their chanting according to their spiritual progress. Jiva Goswami also recommends loud chanting. Don't just murmur. Don't just silently hold the beats. Sometimes we see people holding the beats and you ask them, chant. And they say, no, no, I'm chanting, I'm chanting. You don't hear anything. There's no sound comes out from their mouth. No, I'm chanting, I'm chanting. But the chanting should be loud. All the, devot the devotees will chant loudly. Haridas Thakur, you chant loudly. Kolabeka Shridhar, you chant loudly. These people, Shrinivas, uh, Shrinivas Pandit, they were all doing loud chanting. They don't just murmur something. You don't know what they're murmuring. So, chanting the Holy Name, very important business. We need to practice. Harinam Anukirtanam, there is the verse, text number 11. Sukadeva Goswami is saying to Maharaj Parikshit, O King, constant chanting of the holy names of the Lord after the ways of the great authorities is the doubtless and fearless way of success for all, including those who are free from all material desires. So that puts most of us out, right? We're not free from it. Those who are desirous of all material enjoyment. Oh, there's hope for us here. Desirous of material enjoyment. And those who are self-satisfied by dint of transcendental knowledge. So you can see chanting of Hare Krishna is good for everyone. Whether you have all material desires or no material desires, Whatever is your position, but chanting of the holy name is the means to success for everyone.
whatever position, whatever condition you are in. So don't think, oh no, I, you know, I'm not pure enough to chant. I have so many material desires. It's all right. You can chant. You have a lot of material desires. It will be good for you. The chanting will help you. Of course, we don't want to take service from the Holy Name. We want to give service. We're meant to give service. Sometimes people chant that they want to take service. They think Krishna should give me. But the mood, the, the mood, proper mood should be to want to serve. They want to give service to Krishna. So, we, we, when we perform this in other places, we will ask everyone, you know, how would you proactively counteract offenses to the holy name? What can you do to help overcome offenses to the holy name? The main offense, the main offense in our chanting generally is inattention. Of course, we have to get people first of all to agree to chant. If you agree to chant, then the question is to help us to chant with better quality. There are stages in chanting. There's the offensive chanting, the clearing stage, and then the pure chanting. So how can we bring our chanting from the Nama Parad, from the offensive level, to the Nama Bas, to the intermediate level? That we can do it by more chanting. That's one way you can help to overcome a fan. Do more chanting. And then also chant with other devotees. You will see devotees, you go to temples where there's many devotees, like in Mayapur in the morning, you will see the devotees. Jai Jagannath Baladev Subhadra. If you go to Mayapur in the morning, Japa program, you see devotees sit in groups and generally they have the Tulsi tree in the middle and the devotees will sit around the Tulsi and they will sit together and chant. And they will help each other by association. They sit there and chant together. It's very good. So maybe you can do that every day. But at least some days you can do it. You're not working every day, are you? I hope not. Sometimes people are. But many people are working at home now, right? They're working at home. So it's an opportunity. You can come here, and chant in the morning, and then go home. So try to counteract our offenses. We we'll get more power in the holy name. The more we are trying, the more we make an effort to try to chant carefully, it, it gives results. You will feel the difference. We want to become Krishna conscious. This is a process. It's all in the holy name. You have to do the chanting properly. And then you will feel the change in the heart. The main inattention, the main offense. So it's described there in, if you read uh, Harinam Chintamani, Haridas Thakur spoke to Lord Chaitanya. Inattention is counted as one of the apparats. Even if one successfully overcomes all other offenses, in chanting, and one is chanting continuously, love of God may not come. One should know that the reason for this is that one is committing the offense known as Brahmada or inattention. This offense will block progress to Prima. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said the goal of life Mahan. The goal of life is to develop love of God. So Haridas Thakur said, this inattentive chanting, this will stop us from achieving the goal of life. So we have to chant with full attention, full concentration. Loud chanting helps 
to give more attention to the holy name. You can do it. You chant loudly, chant Hare Krishna. Oh no, no, you guys, I, you never chant good, you know, very mild. No, you have to chant loudly, you have, you have to get the holy name. Prabhupada said, the louder you chant, the more powerful it becomes. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare this is very attentive chanting, you see. When you chant loud, very potent. Alright? So, the problem, the mind. So, how to counteract the mind, the antidote to an uncontrolled mind. This is the problem, our mind, because the mind is restless. Oh, I have so many things in my mind. Oh, what, what about my office? What about my work? What about my children? What about my breakfast? What about my car? So many things in the mind, right? So, Prabhupada's quoted here from the Purse of Kripunti. There is a quality to such utterances also. It depends on the quality of feeling. You have to feel the holy name, a feeling for Krishna. When we are calling the name of Krishna, the holy name is not different from Lord Krishna. Right? We say, Nam Chintamani Krishna, Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha, Tirna Shudan Nichamukto, Dhanat Nam Nama Nam No. The holy name of Krishna is Chintamani. It's wish fulfilling, touchstone. It will fulfill all of our spiritual desires. That is the power of the Holy Name. So, we want to understand this book. Chant the name with feeling. Prabhupada, what should the feeling be? Like the child separated from the parents. So, you have children, you know what it was like when the children were small and they were looking for you, how they will cry, how they will call for you. So our chanting should be like that. We want to have that mood of feeling when we chant the holy name. Effort. Make that effort. Effort is a gateway from nam aparad to nam abhas. Just making an effort on our part. That makes a big difference. Do we make it an effort or if we're just apathetic? You know, apathy, you couldn't care less. Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, it's not important. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Oh, it doesn't matter. You know, we take it very casually. Apathy. We're supposed to fight against apathy, right? We're doing battle against these that more this apathy, uh, oh, it doesn't matter, why take it so seriously, oh no, we've got time, there's so much time. So like that, so there, you can see some quotes here. First of all, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Thakur said, unless we extend our best effort and qualify ourselves for the Lord's mercy, it is next to impossible that we will be rescued from our fallen condition. Next to impossible. So we have to make that great effort. Then that is very important. And then from Prabhupada's first canto, chapter 7, Prabhupada said, Revival of the dormant affection of love of God does not depend on the mechanical system of hearing and chanting, but it solely and wholly depends on the causeless mercy of the Lord. When the Lord is fully satisfied with the sincere efforts of the devotee, he may, he may endow him with his loving, transcendental service. 
So, both Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada and our own Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada are pointing out the importance, how we have to make that effort. We have to put some effort into this chanting. Try to make a real endeavor to capture the Lord, get the attention of the Lord. When you want something very badly, you do a lot to get it. You know, when you want that job, you want that promotion, you make great efforts to get it. I remember there was this one young woman, she was, she wanted to get the scholarship to go to study in America and she had to take the, the English exam. What do they call it? No? I IELTS? I, anyway, different exams, there's so many exams now. Anyway, she had this thing, she had memorized the whole English dictionary. Every word in the dictionary. So serious, you know, oh, so determined. I have to pass this exam. I have to do well. You know, when you want something really badly, you really try hard to get it. You see couples, sometimes they want a child, right? They don't have a child. They make such great efforts. They'll spend huge amounts of money. They'll go to all kinds of things, endeavor just to, to get a child. Now, if we want to get Krishna consciousness, if we want to get Krishna praying, we have to make an effort. There has to be that endeavor. It's very important. It doesn't come just mechanically. We really have to want it. Guru Govinda Maharaj used to talk about making a school for crying, to train everyone to cry for Krishna. When you can cry for Krishna, that's a qualification. But, as one man used to say to me in our Calcutta temple, he used to say, I can cry for my wife. I can cry for my children. I can cry for my business. But I cannot cry for Krishna. Everything else we can cry for. Not Krishna. Okay, well, another small point here. Physiology affects psychology. There are different, not when you're, with some different ways people, you can chant while you're moving around the room. Maybe if you sit, it's so difficult for you to concentrate. So you can get up, you can walk around the room. Just like we have Tosi here. And you can walk around Tosi, you can be going around Tosi and chanting. Or some people close their eyes. Some people want to, they absorb their vision in something. Some people just sit. And other people sit and they're shaking their body like this, you know, back and forth. And some people, they move their head. Different things you can do. All, it, it, the, your mind is thinking more about the body than about the chanting, you know, you, because you're doing this, you're doing that. Lokanan Swami tells, when he was a young devotee, he was sitting chanting, and he was chanting and moving his knees up and down, and Prabhupada yelled at him, You! Stop it! <laughs> Prabhupada didn't like it, told him, Stop it. So Lokanan Swami always remembers that. He got... The mercy. Close your arms over your chest. That's another thing you can hold. Place your hands in pranam over your heart. <laughs> different things, mudras, different ways you can move your body. See how it affects your mind, affects your consciousness, affects your chanting. So creating a favorable lifestyle. Lifestyle has a lot to do with how successfully we are able to chant the holy name. The lifestyle you have. Are you living a life in the mode of passion? Probably most of you are. You live in the city. Many of you are driving cars. You've got to have some passion. 
working in this material life, material atmosphere. So lifestyle has a lot to do with our chanting. And part of the lifestyle, I was mentioning, waking up early in the morning, getting a good start to the day makes a big difference. But if you stay up late at night, you sleep late, you get up late, you rush off to work, you didn't turn any rounds, and you go off, whoa, horrible, terrible. Your whole day will be inauspicious. But if you take rest earlier, wake up earlier, and chant, sit and chant the holy name, or Walk and chant, but that's also very good. Go up, Prabhupada would always go morning walk, go for a walk, jump a walk, and chant. Very good. What do you do? You sit in your car all day, then you get to the office, you sit in an air conditioned room all day, you never get any fresh air, you never get any exercise. Not a good, healthy lifestyle. Very bad. Very Tamasic and Rajasic. You need to have a good lifestyle and it can help you in your chanting. So devotees are encouraged. Take rest on time. Get up early. Chant the holy moon. Take advantage of the morning hours to do sadhana. That is the banking hours for the devotees. The morning hours, your sadhana, that is what's going to make the difference in your consciousness throughout the day. And if you don't do any sadhana in the morning, then I don't know what kind of Krishna consciousness you have. If the whole morning you didn't do any hearing and chanting, you just wake up, paint your face, put on some makeup or something, then get in your cars and go off to work. Where is the, where is the bhakti? Oh, at night I'll chant. It's not a good lifestyle. You have to balance the material and the spiritual. It's very crucial for us. What good habits can be incorporated to improve our japa. There's a lot of things we could do. Very simple things. <laughs> right? So, waking up regularly. Mongol Aunty. Worshipping Tulsi Devi. Alright, any questions? Yes, Prabhu? I cannot hear you, Prabhu. You can take the mic. There is one or two people who came and I asked them to chant the situation, but I already chanted like that. I don't need to, Prabhu. And they're already chanting? Okay, without the beats, they chanted. Oh, without the beats? Yeah. Okay. So, we can introduce them to beats, give them some beats, and encourage them to use the beats. Chanting on beats is recommended because it engages the sense of touch. And we want, want to use all of our senses in the service of Krishna. So chanting on beats. Lord Chaitanya chanted on beats. And Lord Brahma chanted on beats. Lord Shiva chants on beats. It's recommended by all the great sacred versions. Yeah, okay. Yes, If you don't ch chant one lack of names, then you're fallen. Yes, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati said that. That was in the times of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. He said like that. However, Srila Prabhupada gave him a session. Srila Prabhupada said, you chant 
16 rounds, minimum, and try to chant more, and then chant 16 rounds, minimum, and at the same all day you should be engaged in Krishna's service. You spend the day engaged in Krishna's service. You didn't, he, he gave that concession that you couldn't, the devotees found it very difficult to chant one lakh, but he allowed them to chant six, 16 rounds, provided they also engaged in Krishna's service throughout the day. So if you can chant one lakh, that's good. Chanting can always go on. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Kirtani Yasa Dahari. So chant 16 rounds of beats and then the other day, the rest of the day you can be chanting also. Maybe when you're driving your car, you don't want to be chanting on beats, but you can be chanting. You can be chanting to yourself, you can be chanting, you can even be having music. You can be chanting, singing kirtan, but you're cooking in the kitchen, you're cooking, you can be chanting, you're doing your laundry, you can be chanting, you can always be chanting, keep the holy name always on your tongue. And if you do like that, then in the course of the day your chanting will come to close to one lakh. So Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati had that agreement with the devotees, it's not that the one lakh Rounds had to be chanted on the beats every day, but they would be doing things like devotees would be in the garden and devotees would be doing other different services and at the same time they would be chanting. So the chanting goes on and in this way the chanting comes to one line. Okay, if you have more time, if you're retired, you're not working, then you can do one line. Yes, Maharaji? Work and chant. Work and chant. Yes. Um, is there any uh, can we pray in the fire uh, when we walk in the chance to do that? Is it just to be a fire or can we get stopped to fire? There are no rules about that. There's no rules about how you have to be addressed. You know, coming to the temple is a bit different, but as far as just walking around outside, we don't mind how you dress, that's not a very big issue. The important thing is chanting, that's very good. So sometimes you may be dressed as a devotee, sometimes not as a devotee, sometimes you're in what we call karmi dress, it's okay. But you're chanting, that's the main thing. Yes, Prabhu. Yeah. 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 Put your hands up in the air and smile and try and be depressed. You can't do it. You can't feel depressed. You put your hands up in the air and smile. Can you feel depressed? Cannot. You feel joyful. Put your hands up in the air and smile. That is, it's natural. You're going to be joyful when you do that. And so we get people to become joyful even if they're depressed when they may come in the temple room. But if they join in the kirtan and put their hands up in the air and start to sing, and the, they'll become joyful. The depression will all be wiped away by the chanting of the holy name. So that's the meaning. So different postures have different effects on us. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, they don't get the taste for chanting. Well, what to do? They have to do more chanting. They have to do more service. Service will help them to develop the taste for chanting. If we encourage, we encourage people to do service, it's stated, Shrusha Shrusha Dana Shrusha Dana Shya Vasi Pek Tairuchi Shanna Hatsi Vayabhikra Punya Tirtana Shevana By serving the devotees, great service is done. By such service one gains affinity for hearing the message of the Bhagavatam and similarly for hearing the Holy Name. They will develop more taste if they chant. They do service. The example was given about people with jaundice. People with jaundice cannot taste the sweetness of the sugar candy. So the same way people in the beginning, they're chanting, they have no taste. But if they keep chanting, gradually they can develop a taste. It will take, just take some time. We should understand that they have the jaundice of materialism. They have no taste for the chanting because of their materialistic contamination. So they need to be purified. And the way to be purified is by service. So engage them in service. And in this way they will develop more taste. Sometimes joining the Sankirtan, joining the Kirtan, it's very good to get taste, more taste for the whole name. Okay. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. Shri Prabhupada ki. Go back to Brinda ki.